This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Go to skl.sh slash theplainbagel8 to get a free two-month premium trial. <sighs> Real estate. Do you want to be wealthy beyond your wildest dreams? Well, I've got one word for you. Real estate. No, we're not talking about buying your first house. What are you, five? This is the big leagues, kid. We're talking real estate investing. Cash flows, Gah. capital appreciation, Gah. indigestion, real estate. <laughs> oh God, I'm a child. All kidding aside, today we actually are talking about real estate, but specifically real estate investment trusts or REITs. These are companies that individuals can invest in, just like a stock, to gain exposure to real properties. And while I'm not gonna stand here and tell you that real estate is the way to become a millionaire for the average Joe, there is a reason that many investors covet real estate assets. Buying a property allows the investor to benefit from rising real estate prices. And if you rent the property, you can earn a stable flow of income. By buying a REIT, investors gain a similar exposure without needing to operate properties themselves, offering an attractive entry point for small and beginner investors. But while that probably sounds straightforward enough, there are some important details you need to be aware of before you make your first purchase of a REIT unit or share. So let's go over the REIT security and how it differs from your standard stock on today's plain bagel. REITs were created in the US in 1960 as a way to allow everyday investors to gain exposure to real estate without taking on excessive risk or requiring large sums of money. Since then, the security structure has been introduced to a number of countries around the world, including here in Canada. And these days, it's a very popular instrument held alongside stocks and many portfolios. But for beginners, it's probably not clear what a REIT is or how it differs from a corporation. After all, units or shares of a REIT can be traded publicly on stock exchanges, like the New York Stock Exchange in the US or the Toronto Stock Exchange in Canada. And while in Canada, units of a REIT are given a .un suffix, there isn't much else that differentiates them from standard stocks. But REITs are primarily an income instrument. While stocks have the option of paying a dividend, REITs are required to pass along most of their profits to investors, which we'll touch on later. Some REITs earn and pass on revenue from mortgages they lend to home buyers, but the standard equity REIT, which we'll focus on today's video, typically earns its revenue the way you would expect, from the rent tenants pay on properties they own. Now the types of properties held by a REIT can greatly alter the risk return features of the company. So it's worth going over the different types of REITs that you can run into. Residential REITs, for example, own and operate homes, apartment buildings, and condos, which they often rent out to individuals and families under one year terms. Given the essential nature of housing, these REITs are often viewed as being on the safer end of the REIT risk spectrum, although they are far from immune to financial strain and can still suffer if there's an economic downturn. At the other end of the spectrum are retail REITs, which own malls and other retail buildings and shopping centers. Retail REITs rent out their space to retailers. And while residential REITs typically charge a fixed rent, retail REITs actually have a variable component to the rent they charge that's based on store sales, meaning that the REITs share some operational risk with their tenants, earning more money when retailers see higher sales and less when business is slower than usual. There are also office REITs, which, as the name suggests, own buildings that provide office space for either a single tenant or multiple tenants. And industrial REITs are a broader category that include everything from warehousing space to factory sites. Other REITs still hold multi-purpose buildings. And you can even find REIT companies with more unconventional properties, including hospitals, data centers, bridges, self-storage sites, and even cell phone towers. Clearly, the sector encompasses a wide range of businesses with their own unique features and quirks, but the fundamental business model of each is the same. Allow a tenant to use your property and earn a recurring rent. Now, compared to investing in properties yourself, REITs have a number of advantages. Firstly, REITs are professionally managed and require no operating expertise or effort from the investor. Compared to a landlord that may be receiving calls at two in the morning to fix a burst pipe, that itself is obviously a pretty big perk. REITs also provide you exposure to a diversified pool of real estate assets that can span different countries and sectors, whereas most real estate investors often have a lot of money concentrated in individual domestic properties, and they're usually limited in the type of properties that they can hold. Finally, REITs are very liquid. You can invest virtually any amount you have into a REIT and sell the holding on any given trading day, whereas it can take months to settle an actual real estate transaction. Now, obviously there are some advantages to buying properties yourself. 
real estate investors can control the costs of their operations by putting in work themselves. And the leverage offered by mortgages can greatly expand their return potential, especially with low interest rates. But REITs are generally viewed as being the safer and more beginner friendly option of the two. So that's the gist of what a REIT is and why investors like to use them. But why the special label? After all, you don't need to be classified as a REIT to be a real estate company. So what gives? Well, the answer to that question lies in the last word of the label, trust. A trust is a legal entity whereby a trustee holds and manages someone else's assets on their behalf, following strict rules laid out by the trustor, the person who gave them the assets. While in the US, REITs are classified as corporations, in Canada, they are actually designated as unit trusts. And in both countries, this means adhering to a number of strict requirements. For example, the majority of assets held by the REIT must be real property. Makes sense. In the US, at least 75% of the company's assets must be invested in real estate. And in Canada, REITs cannot hold any property that isn't deemed a qualified REIT property. Companies must also derive at least 75% of their gross income from either rents from real property, interest on mortgages financing real property, or the sale of real estate properties themselves. But one of the most notable requirements for REITs is that they must pay out the majority of their profits to investors in the form of dividends in the US and distributions in Canada. In other words, REITs don't typically retain their earnings, but instead pass them through to their investors. This sort of goes on with the idea that the real properties held in the trust belong to the investors themselves. In the same way owning an apartment building would generate you income from the rents paid by the tenants, REITs take the money they earn and split it across their investors based on their percentage ownership of the company. But while this may sound like a standard dividend that you might get from another stock, it has a very important implication when it comes to your taxes. You see, when a normal company earns income, it pays corporate taxes on the amount earned to the government and can then choose to pay a dividend to their investors using their after-tax profits. When investors receive the money, it is taxed a second time at the investor level, but at a preferential dividend rate. When it comes to REITs, however, dividends and distributions are passed along to investors before they're taxed at the corporate level. This effectively eliminates any corporate tax a company would have to pay if they choose to pass along all of their income for the year. But rather than canceling the tax liability itself, it simply passes it on to the investor. In the US, REIT dividends are unqualified, meaning they are taxed at an individual's marginal income tax rate rather than the preferential dividend rate seen by standard stock dividends. In Canada, the taxation is more complicated because the trusts pay distributions rather than dividends. This just means that the amount paid to the investor can contain a number of different sources of money, including income, return of capital, and other payments, each of which come with different taxation implications. I'll leave a link in the description below where you can learn more about that. But the point is that the taxation of REIT distributions and dividends is different than that of money from a standard corporation. Obviously, this is something you'll need to be aware of when filing your taxes. And while income from REITs isn't inherently taxed more heavily than standard dividends when you consider the corporate and investor taxes, it's something to consider when comparing the higher yield of a REIT to that of another company. While a REIT online may look to offer an 8% yield when you do a quick Google search, its after-tax yield may be less than that of a stock showing a yield of 7.5%. All that being said, REITs are still a popular income instrument especially if held in a tax-exempt or tax-deferred account, like the 401k in the US or the TFSA in Canada. On top of this, even though REITs are sought out for their dividends, their unit price can appreciate just like other stocks. You see, even with a REIT paying out 100% of its income, it may still see its unit or share price increase as properties appreciate in value, and the company itself improves or expands operations with debt or equity financing. Again, this makes the return earned on a REIT similar to that of owning a property yourself, albeit with less leverage and certainly less hassle. So that's the basic overview of the REIT. With all the millionaires that we see out there building their massive real estate empires by their mid 20s, there are probably a few investors watching this that are enthusiastic about hopping into the industry. But as with any investment, it's important to look into whether the security is an appropriate holding for you given your unique financial situation. Investing in REITs also provides no return guarantee. It requires just as much diligence as investing in stocks. So in the same way you wouldn't buy a house without checking out the foundation, you probably should know a thing or two about the REITs you buy. 
You can gauge the profitability of a REIT by calculating measures like funds from operations, adjusted FFO, and net operating income, industry-specific measures of profitability that many analysts view as being more appropriate for real estate than net income. And there are many different operating metrics used to compare companies, including occupancy levels and rent per square foot. If you're looking for a place to get started to learn about REIT investing, REIT.com is a website with a lot of great information on the security. It's a webpage for the National Association of REITs. And aside from covering the basics, they actually offer a standardized measure for some of the metrics we just mentioned. So if you see a company reporting an NA REIT FFO on their filings, you know it's comparable to another company's NA REIT measure. So real estate investing may seem like a big endeavor, but REITs have greatly simplified the process for everyday investors. And with the right strategy and mindset, you too can become a real estate investing guru. Hi, Graham Steven. Yeah, how's the condo financing coming along? Oh, Richard, yeah. the landlord's here. He says your rent check bounced. Oh, uh, uh, just one second, Graham. I'll, I'll have to call you back. I, I have an yeah. issue. Graham also messaged me and said that you need to stop using his name in your YouTube videos, especially about real estate, since you clearly don't know anything about real estate. Oh. Uh, so, landlord? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I need those. It's sunny out. So about first time home buying being for five year olds. Well, the truth is that my wife and I actually just bought our first house. And yes, we're really excited because let me tell you, we were looking for a long time, but as an avid do it yourselfer, let's just say that I'm quickly finding out that there's a lot to learn about home ownership. But I've been picking up a lot of great tips from Skillshare who sponsored today's video. For example, lately I've been watching how to design your dream kitchen. Yeah, I know for my first home it's probably a little ambitious, but it's a great course that points out where it's worth spending money and what you need to consider when you're working on a kitchen. And it's a great example of the content you can find on Skillshare. You see, Skillshare is a skill sharing platform and they offer thousands of videos and tutorials on basically anything you can think of. For example, if you're someone who is far from their first home, but still interested in investing their money, investing basics for millennials is a great starting point. And honestly, whether you're trying a new hobby or hoping to improve some professional skill, you'll likely find what you're looking for on the site. And here's the best part. Normally Skillshare costs $10 a month, but if you're one of the first 1,000 people to go to skl.sh slash theplainbagel8, link in the description below, you'll get a two month free trial of the premium membership to give it a shot. It'll support the channel and give you access to a huge library of tutorials and lessons. So if you want to learn or try something new, I encourage you to check out Skillshare. 